Good morning everyone, or afternoon depending on where you are. It's morning here. Uh, my name is Matt Osborne. Welcome back to class number six, I think, for Bodhi Tree Buddhism, where we are continuing our reading of the classic text, the modern classic, The Way to Buddhahood Cheng Fu Zhi Dao, by the great scholar monk, Venerable Master In Xuan. So welcome along, whether you're new or whether you've been with us before, um, I'm happy that you can join us today. Okay, so let's um, jump on into the text uh, and see where we were up to. So we've gone through each of the three refuges in turn, Buddha, Dharma and Sangha. And we talked about some of the qualities of each of those. Now we still haven't quite finished the section here. There's a little bit that kind of rounds them out. So as you can see from what we've got in front of us here at the moment, um, we have got the virtues in principle and in practice. So today we're going to look at this idea of these two aspects. Um, and we sort of say the sort of more abstract and ultimate sense of the three jewels or the more sort of concrete, um, I always want to say mundane, but it's not quite the right word. Um, the more concrete sense uh, for each of them as well. Uh, so this is this verse here, verse 12, and also just the basic statement of going to ref for refuge. So let's have a look at this first one here, verse 12. San bao zhen shi de wu lou xing qing jing, hua shi zhen yi su fo fa de chang chun. The real virtue of the three treasures is free from outflows and pure in nature. To transform the world, take refuge in both the real and the mundane. Thus, the Buddha Dharma can remain for long. I've already found one word here. I think I need to change it. That's the word mundane. We'll get to that in a second. So the first line, pretty straightforward. Um, the real virtue of the three treasures. So, you know, as I just mentioned, when we talk about the Buddha, Dharma and Sangha, there's many different ways of looking at these and sort of defining these terms. <clears throat> I mean, when we think about, say, the Buddha, you know, on one side, when we read some sort of literature about Buddhism, we're told, you know, the Buddha was just a man. He was a historical figure. He lived in a particular place and time. You know, person of flesh and blood. He, he wasn't a deity. He wasn't son of God, anything like this. He's, he's not... It's not some creator principle or something like that. So sometimes we're told about the Buddha in this very like concrete way. Hey, he's just like me, he's just like you. Well, yeah, kind of. Uh, uh, in some ways, perhaps. <laughs> However, let's not, you know, we have to be careful that um, some texts kind of like a bit overplay that a bit too much. You know, he's just totally like me and like you. Well, not, not quite, to be honest. <clears throat> but then some, some other teachings will, you know, sort of talk about the Buddha um, in this very abstract sense, um, we might think of a very famous line from the Diamond Sutra. Um, let me just sort of like translate it from Chinese um, in my head. So this idea of, you know, those who seek me through my physical form and those who seek me through the sound of my voice are on the wrong path and they cannot truly see me. Wow, but like, isn't that the Buddha? I can, you know, standing in front of the Buddha right now, isn't that the Buddha? No, this is taking the idea of the Buddha as as truth, you know, the actual the realization, that experience of awakening of body that makes the Buddha the Buddha. And this is the sense of what is meant by the Buddha. And it's not then the physical form. It's not then limited to, you know, um, a particular person at a particular place or time. It's not even limited, we could say, to gender or even to species, dare I add like portrayals of Buddha, Dharma and Sangha. I mean, I've just given examples for the Buddha, but it's, it's also a similar principle for the Dharma. You know, sometimes Dharma is just is just the teachings of the Buddha, um, you know, which are written in words in a particular language you can write them down, put them in books, put them on your shelf. But there's also the sense of Dharma as like, it's this kind of ultimate truth. It's, it's this all pervasive reality. You know, so, so which one are we taking refuge in? And likewise, even for the Sangha, um, Many places, particularly in the West, where there are very few um, ordained monastics, um, I often see this kind of this this usage in the West of talking about the sangha as a, like a particular community, and people will say, "Oh, this is my sangha, um, this is my community." You know, I go I go into town, and there's a particular group. You know, maybe there's the Oxford Buddhist Society or something. Um, 
Actually, I don't think there is an Oxford Buddhist Society. Um, and that's my Sangha. There's a lot of people that kind of use the expression like this. Now, it's not wrong, um, but actually I don't, I don't encounter that kind of usage in Asia at all. They don't talk about a particular group. Um, that might be a, a monastery or a temple or something. But usually Sangha is used in a different sense. But again, they might then refer to the Sangha as being the ordained clergy. Now, you're in robes, shaved head, um, that particular lifestyle, and that's the Sangha. Hmm? Or what about like, you know, the, the actual realization, um, you know, that makes one a truly um, liberated person other than the Buddhas. So when we talk about in Bodhisattva, Avalokiteshvara, we talk about Manjushri. I mean, don't they have this incredible depth of wisdom? They're not Buddhas. Um, isn't that even higher than what, you know, we talk about when I talk about some local Buddhist group? So shouldn't that also be the Sangha? So which one are we referring to here? So this is what this verse deals with. And I think it's quite useful to clarify this and to think about it in a bit more detail. So as you can see from the first couple of lines, um, here it's talking about like the kind of ultimate sense. So the real virtue or the, you know, the 真实的, the sort of true, real, we could say virtue. Um, this, this character here, de, right, this one here can mean virtue. It can actually though often be a translation of a Sanskrit word called gunna, which just means like a quality of something. It's not, you know, virtue has kind of got this value judgment on it, you know, virtuous versus non-virtuous, which is appropriate in the case of the three treasures. But it could also just be the qualities that Zen Siddha would be like the true, the ultimate qualities of the three jewels, the Buddha, Dhamma and Sangha. A couple of things, really, really they're just the same thing. So wulo, which means being free from outflows. Outflows are, it's a, it's a very common term for the afflictions. Um, there's a bit of discussion about what this term means. I'm not going to go into that now. And the Chinese character is, um, refers to like a leak. So if you've got a leak in your roof, you've got a leak in your cup, that's a lo. So it's leaking something out. It's not, <laughs> it's not like integral it's it's has lost its original integrity to be able to withstand the weather or hold your liquid inside or whatever um but it could be something that's leaking in like a leaky roof or it could be something like a cup where it's leaking out so there's a bit of confusion among scholars about what sense it is but one thing is very clear it refers to the afflictions and so when we're talking about the true qualities of the buddha and dharma and saying we're talking about the quality of being freed from afflictions now if we think about that particularly if, say, for example, when we talk about the Sangha, hey, that doesn't mean my local Buddhist community is automatically pure and free from affliction. That would, that would mean that you know, my, my local Buddhist Sangha would have to be all liberated arahants or, or Buddhas or something like that. Or, um, so we can talk about then the Sangha in terms of that realization of liberation, which isn't then the sense of just every practicing Buddhist. And then the second term there, Qing Jing, just means pure, purity. Um, again, it's the same idea, to be free from afflictions, to be few, free from things that are impure, free from the dirt, that taint that comes about from desire, aversion, and ignorance. Okay, so that's fairly straightforward. Here the second line kind of then broadens that out. So Hua Si, and this, this term here, hua, which I've translated as transform, kind of literally it means that, to transform or to change something. But it also has this um, sense of to like teach or, you know, uh, educate even. Often the, the broader term in Chinese is jiao hua, which means to teach and transform. This idea that by teaching the Dharma to people, it changes them, it transforms them for the better. So if we're going to do that, if we're going to transform the world and that, also includes ourselves, we actually need to take refuge in not just this ultimate sense, but also in this kind of more basic sense. Now, we've got two terms here, zin, which is the same term here as jin, which means like true or real. And this character here, so, in other contexts, it means like kind of um, like secular, <laughs> not really secular. It's also not mundane because mundane literally means worldly, right? Mondo, so the world. Um, as opposed to like transcendental, liberated. Um, so I'm not too sure if I should translate this as mundane or... It's also the same character, these two characters here, Zin and Saul, 
for like ultimate truth and conventional truth. Maybe I should try that. Ultimate and conventional. There you are. Joining in this class, you can have a live, live translation of modern classic Buddhist texts. So, okay, back to it. To, so if we're going to transform the world, we're going to teach the world, we really need both of these. And this is the key point of this verse here. Some people kind of get a bit stuck in the ultimate sense. You know, I only take refuge in the Buddha as this sort of ultimate realization. I only take refuge in the Dharma as this sort of like ultimate all-pervasive truth. And the Sangha as like all the liberated you know, sages, but then, you know, this bunch of people that I meditate with on a Friday night, you know, they're just kind of regular, unliberated people, and I don't take refuge with them. And there's a bit of a problem with that. <laughs> Sometimes people can kind of get a bit, they kind of set that, you know, their standards a bit too high. It can, can lead to a bit of arrogance or pride. Um, it can also mean that we don't support those who are still on the basic levels of practice. And that's quite unfortunate. I often hear this also from um, Western Buddhist groups, this idea that, you know, it's difficult to practice um, because they don't get support. And you get some people, they might spend some time in some Asian Buddhist communities in Asia, and they see, you know, people spend time in the monastery. Um, in most places you can do this. You, you don't have to necessarily like ordain, become a monk or a nun. Um, but just you can often go and live in a monastery as a, in a kind of this role. There is a there's a couple of terms that are used. Sometimes they're called stewards, where you are performing work for the monastery, uh, but you're not a monastic member. And and this is often very much needed. So, for example, if you're in Theravadan traditions, where the monastics um, by and large won't touch money. Um, those monasteries still have to pay bills and things. So who does that? So you have some lay people that do those roles. And some people then actually live in the monasteries. They then have very close contact with the Sangha. They have that very um, good practice environment, um, but then they're fulfilling some very important roles for the Sangha as well, because they don't have precepts that prevent them from engaging in those in, in, in certain activities. Um, so where was I going? So some people can see that experience and then they come back to the West and they say, you know, oh, and I wanted to go on a retreat in my local monastery or something, but I had to pay for it. And they feel kind of a bit miffed by that. Why do I have to pay for it? And I actually don't have to pay. Well, yeah, it's true. I mean, there's a lot of reasons for it. One is just simply, you know, outside of Asia and Asian Buddhist countries, they don't have that long tradition when people don't feel that, you know, this long practice of, of understanding the value um, on so many levels of Buddhist communities and then being able to support it. But at the same time, some people might have this attitude that like, well, I want to go on ret retreat and I think other people should support me in the monastery. And I would I would ask, well, are you supporting other people when they go on retreat? Because, you know, what goes around comes around. That's That's where we have this kind of idea of merit. And that's very much why... Um, in many monasteries, so my experience say in, in Taiwan, people will often do a lot of volunteer work for the temple when they're lay people. They're not even living there, they'll just do volunteer work. And that creates sort of merit. Um, later on, they might engage in some retreat or some, you know, some long-term practice at the monastery, maybe a short-term monastic retreat or a, a weekend or a longer meditation retreat. And that that doesn't cost anything. You, you go and you participate and that's being supported by the community. But remember, you've already made your contribution. And even when people become monastics, you know, um, many traditions, so I know of one tradition, one, one monastery in Taiwan, where when you first join as a monastic, you work your butt off. <laughs> you will just be doing so much work. Um, I think it's for like 10 years or something. But after that, basically, you don't have to do any work whatsoever. You're totally free. And it's kind of a bit um, of this sort of trial period. You make your contribution to the monastery and don't worry, the monastery will look after you. And it will also kind of test people in a way um, whether they really have that commitment. Now, I'm not actually a big fan of that because I think when people first come there, they also, they can't just be working 24 seven sort of manual work. They also need some time for other activities. And so I think it should be balanced out a bit more. 
But back to my point here about taking refuge in the sort of the ultimate and the conventional. If we don't support the conventional, if we don't support monastic communities, even if those monastics and those communities are not these pristine pure examples of you know they're not like modern day Shariputra and Moggallana and Mandrushri and Avalokiteshvara still support them <laughs> you know everyone goes in as just a regular person and everyone's just sort of trying their best you know I'm, I'm not saying if, if people are literally corrupt or whatever I don't support that but <laughs> but if people are, are committed and they're sincere support it um, likewise, too, we can talk about, you know, wanting to understand the ultimate truth of the Dharma. But if we don't support printing of Buddhist books and materials, if we don't support your favorite Facebook and YouTube Dharma class, um, <laughs> that's not the whole point of my of my class today to get onto this. <laughs> Sorry, I don't mean to be so self-referential. Um, if we don't support those kinds of things, how is anyone going to get to this point of having an actual deeper understanding of the Dharma? So we need to work on those levels need to work on the basic level of where we're at, but also keep our eyes on kind of the ultimate sense of them too. And by doing so, we get to line number four, thus the Buddha Dharma can remain for long. Now here, this expression Buddha Dharma means the teachings of the Buddha. Um, and this idea of Tang Tun, remain for long, <clears throat> actually comes from, well, we see this idea a lot in um, the Vinaya. So the Vinaya with the rules and the whole idea of why the Buddha set up a set of rules for the for the monastics is closely tied in with the idea that the Buddhas of the past, so Shakyamuni Buddha, using his knowledge of past lives, could see the Buddhas of the past. And he knew that some of those Buddhas um, didn't really set up a very systematic monastic community with a set of rules and guidelines. And because of that, after they parinirvanaed, um, their dharma didn't last for long. And that meant that people who didn't live just at the time of those Buddhas, um, they didn't really necessarily have that good access to the teachings, which is quite unfortunate, right? Obviously, Buddhists try to teach as many people as they can while they're still alive. But they also want this legacy to continue on. But Shakyamuni Buddha could also see some other Buddhas of the past did set up Vinaya teachings. They did set up clear rules for a community to maintain those teachings in the world and the result of that was that those teachings lasted longer and people could learn from them even like we do now you know hundreds even a couple of thousand years after the time of the buddha so that's what we need to do we need to also support the kind of mundane level the basic level dharma teachings dharma classes printing of books movies videos you name it whatever medium that the teachings come in we need to support people who are doing their best to practice the Dharma because we need those in order to build up to this ultimate sense of awakened people who realize the truth in the community of other liberated people um, that they teach. Okay, we've got one more line here, one more verse here for, day, for today. Okay, so... Let's just go through the Chinese, as we always do, and then the English. So this is just basically going for refuge. Um, One vows, until the end of my life, I go for refuge to the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. With a sincere heart, cultivate, making offerings, and always be mindful of the excellent benefits. So, the start of it, just so oneself, and you make a vow or a kind of make a promise, if you will. You make a claim, a statement. This is what I'm going to do. And so, what is that? Now, line two here, so gui for fa sing is kind of the heart of it. But in this version, they add on this jin sing so. Now, not all versions of taking refuge have this. Um, so, you know, it is a bit debatable, you know, oh, if I take refuge in Buddha, Dharma, Sangha, does it have to be to the end of my life? I mean, like any vow, it's... <laughs> I don't know if vow is the right word, but it's saying, it's a commitment. It's saying, look, this is what I intend to do. And like any intention, you, you just do your best. If you can't always do that, um, then just try again, right? Sometimes, sometimes it's a similar idea with like, you know, taking the precepts, you say, 
well, you know, I, I intend to not kill any living beings. But what if I kill them? It doesn't mean that you're lying or something. It just means that like we have, you know, that's what I want to do, but I can't quite do it yet. It's like if I say, I want to learn how to do a somersault. You know, I'm learning gymnastics. I want to learn how to do a somersault. So I try to do a somersault, but I can't and I fall land on my face. Am I a liar? Am I bad? No, it just means that I haven't learned it yet, right? I haven't got to that level of skill. And we can say the same also with taking refuge. Um, it's our intention to put our our support and our refuge in the three jewels, in the three treasures. Um, but this is also something that we need, like, need to train in. We still might have habits of trying to seek support elsewhere. or thinking that, you know, something else can ultimately save us. Um, sex, drugs, rock and roll, money, pizza, ice cream. Um, and it's going to take us a while to kind of break out of that habit. So we've got this idea here of until the end of my life, it's it's just to sort of say, this is my intention and I'm going to keep on working on this. All right, I'm going to keep on working on this. I might not always get it right. And if I get it wrong, then just come back and try again. Now, this kind of idea here, this idea of like it's something we're training in, it's not something that when we say it, um, that if in the future that doesn't happen, we're somehow bad. That's not the point. We're going to come back to this idea later on when we talk about the precepts as well. It's a training, right? The whole practice of the Dharma is a training. And like any kind of training, you won't get it right at first. If you do get it right at first, then you know, up, your, up your, you know, your expectations, set yourself a higher goal and keep working on that. Okay, anyway, so until the end of my life, I go for refuge to the Buddha, Dharma and Sangha. So the common expression, Pali, Sanskrit, they're almost identical. Um, so Buddham Saranam Gachami, Dharmam Saranam Gachami, Sangam Saranam Gachami. So the term Gachami just means um, I go. Um, it's very simple. And where do I go? Saranam, which is this term refuge, or as we've talked about earlier, like sanctuary, safe place, um, support, something we can rely on. And then there's three different types. Um, Buddham Saranam, Dharmam Saranam, and Sangam Saranam. So Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. And you go through these um, one by one. Commonly in Theravadan traditions, well, also in the Chinese traditions as well, you can, you can do it like three times. Um, there's like kind of set, set like patterns and ways of saying it. So I go for refuge to the Buddha, I go for refuge to the Dharma, I go for refuge to the Sangha. For the second time, I go to refuge for the Buddha. For the second time, I go to refuge for the Dharma. For the second time, I go to refuge to the Sangha. And for the third time, I go for refuge to the Buddha. For the third time, I go for refuge to the Dharma. For the third time, I go for refuge to the Sangha. Buddhism likes doing things in threes. It's, um, there is a reason for it. It's not just mindless repetition. Um, Repetition isn't always mindless. Um, it has an important effect. It 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 settles it in your mind. You know, it's like it's like meditation. You know, meditate on your breath. You know, focus on your breath. I mean, if you're if you're a Buddha, you can probably just focus on one breath and immediately go into samadhi or dhyana. But you can't. It needs to be repeated, repeated, repeated until that becomes a very deep ingrained um, part of who we are. Um, so. A thing to encourage us um, in continuing that refuge. Um, two things here. So with a sincere heart, cultivate making offerings. So the term here, gong yang, which I've translated as making offerings. Some in the Chinese, it's got this kind of particularly the same character, yang. It's like the character at the bottom of that character is a food. <laughs> and it, it, in the narrow sense, when people talk about gong yang, they talk about like giving food, so offerings of food to the sangha. Or giving offerings of material things, shall we say? It might be robes, it might be medicine, it might be other needs or supplies. Um, not not just to the sangha, but also say to the Buddhas, making a food offering in front of a Buddha statue or water offering, incense. But sometimes, actually, the term Gong Yang has a far broader sense, and it's really more connected with the Indian term Puja. So Puja is is really almost like worship. Um, now, when I say that in English, a lot of people don't like that. Um, but usually it's because this idea that like, kind of worships for other religions. Buddhism doesn't do worship. Um, yeah, no, Buddhism, Buddhism does do worship, <laughs> totally. Um, obviously it's not worship to a god or something like that, but the way in which Buddhists, you know, their relationship with say the Buddha or the Sangha 
and worship is appropriate. And so that includes not just providing material needs, prostrations, um, praising. Um, there's a whole range of these things. So a couple of texts, you got, later on there'll be this developed system of like seven limbs of worship, seven limbs of puja. So praising their good qualities and, and so on and so forth. Um, and that's important. That's actually good practice. It's good Buddhist practice. And again, it's one of those things that I think in the West, you know, because of the way in which Buddhism is being portrayed as this sort of perfectly rational, um, it conforms with science. Anything that Christianity is, Buddhism is like the opposite. So Christianity is about faith. So Buddhism, Buddhism doesn't do faith. Um, you know, this kind of thing. I mean, there are definitely differences. There are some very big major differences. But to think that sort of like Buddhism is like this almost like opposite of Christianity, oh, it's pretty naive. And and it's not just naive, it's, it's actually detrimental to our practice. Um, faith is an important thing. Going for refuge is an act of faith in a sense. When we start our practice, we can talk about like the qualities of Buddha and Sangha and we can talk about like this service, I mean, maybe service is another good way to translate the term puja. So with a sincere heart, develop service to the three jewels. Let's try that. Cultivate service. And always be mindful of the excellent benefits. So when we act with a wholesome state of mind, so here a sincere state of mind, a sincere state towards a virtuous object or virtuous person, say Buddha, Dharma and Sangha, that is a very wholesome form of karma. And a wholesome karma is basically what is meant by merit. So you might have heard this term, Buddhists cultivate merit, Buddhists develop merit. And it's kind of weird. Like I find a lot of people in the West kind of like this merit idea, I'm not too sure about that, not sure if I believe in it. Often it's portrayed as very like transactional. <laughs> um, but then say, oh, but I believe in karma. I mean, merit, punya, is just wholesome karma, basically. It's really not much difference. <laughs> There's basically no difference. So when we have this, this like good, clean, pure um, state of mind towards the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha, when you think of the Buddha, or you read a story about the Buddha, or see a statue of the Buddha, and think like, well, the Buddha was, you know, a truly amazing person. And I just so admire that that thought right is a very powerful positive thought and there are good results from that that's good for our own mental state our own mental continuum and good for our own future development as well and so it's sometimes helpful to be mindful of the excellent benefits by taking refuge in the buddha dharma and sangha by upholding the precepts it's good for our lives this is the path to happiness it is the path to Happiness in this life, happiness in future lives as well. We're going to get into this just literally in the next little section, I think, or two seconds later. Um, and it's a little reminder and encouragement for ourselves um, to keep up this state of refuge. Now, of course, at first we are just pretty ignorant, regular people, <laughs> and um, and just sort of like taking refuge in the Buddha is not going to like magically dissolve all our problems, but. This is the basic idea of refuge. When the problem happens, you know, you can kind of do that. It's a bit cheesy, but it's actually not too bad. What would the Buddha do? <laughs> How would the Buddha deal with this? Now, you pro we probably won't really be responding to it the way that the Buddha would. The Buddha's reaction would be probably quite intensely different, but we can try the same kind of thing. That's the idea here. And he's going to respond through the Dharma. Okay, thank you very much today, everyone, for coming along. Um, we'll wrap it up here, and we'll be back again next week. I think next week we've got like one little section on the benefits and the essence of going for refuge, and then we get into part two of the book itself, which is on how to how to learn the Dharma, basically. Okay, thanks, everyone. Uh, take care, and I'll see you again soon. Bye-bye.